Today's national webinar is presented by SAMHSA's Gaines Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Today's webinar is titled, Don't Just Wing It, Combining Clinical and Supervision Case Plans to Improve Outcomes in Veteran Treatment Courts. The presenters today are Dr. Shannon Carey, Dr. Brian Meyer, Seth Forey, Victoria Jones, and Nicholas Molina, and I will be introducing each of them shortly. So my name is Dwayne France, and I am the co-director of SAMHSA's Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families Technical Assistance Center. In our role at the TA Center, we support states and communities around the country in establishing suicide prevention and behavioral health coalitions for the military-affiliated population. I'm pleased to partner with GAINS to be able to uh, moderate this panel, not only because of my own work with the SMVF TA Center or my own background as a retired Army non-commissioned officer, but I served as the Colorado 4th Judicial District Veterans Court clinician for over seven years. Um, before we start our presentation, I want to talk a little bit about some housekeeping items. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So for questions, as you go through, you may have some questions, you may be interested in hearing some more things uh, or some explanations, please submit your questions to the presenters in the Q&A pod. The presenters will address these questions. I will be monitoring the Q&A pod uh, as the presentation is going. Uh, we also have a poll, you'll see polls pop up. Um, when prompted, please respond to the poll. Um, and then we will share those responses um, as the poll closes. Um, as this first poll pops up, um, we are interested in hearing where you're coming from. We see in the chat uh, a lot of great uh, hellos from uh, all across the country, uh, but we're interested to hear whether you're in a urban, a suburban, or a rural setting. We recognize that some locations are extremely rural. Uh, that there may be some of you in some very, very scarce pop scarcely populated areas as well as tribal nations. All of those, of course, are underneath the, the, um, the rural designation. So you see the poll pop up. Please go ahead and answer the questions there. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded. The slides will be shared um, after the webinar. Um, we will also notify you when the recording is posted on the YouTube channel. You will receive a certificate of assistance for download at the end of today's webinar. Um, please note that this is for your personal use um, and we are not able to offer CEU credits. Um, in order to ensure that we have as much inclusivity as possible uh, for those who access content in different ways, we are providing American Sign Language interpretation for this event. The interpreters, the interpreters today are Jim Brown and Katie Lambie. Uh, there's also live captioning for today's event. So to view live captioning, click live transcript CC, then select subtitles. A quick look at today's agenda. Uh, shortly after this, Mr. John Berg, uh, the Senior Public Health Advisor for CSAT, will be giving us our federal welcome. Uh, then we will be following, he, following him will be presentations from our speaker. I'd like to turn this over to Mr. Berg, who is a Senior Public Health Advisor for the, Sen for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA for his opening remarks. Mr. Berg. Thank you, Mr. France. I appreciate it. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, don't just wing it, combining clinical and supervision case plans to improve outcomes in veterans treatment courts. As always, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to participate in today's informative webinar. SAMHSA believes that veterans treatment courts are an important resource for communities to assist justice involved veterans and divert them away from incarceration and into treatment. Veterans treatment courts connect these men and women to the benefits and treatment they have earned saving their lives, families, and futures. This proactive approach is accomplished by effectively targeting and addressing participants' clinical needs, including medical, behavioral health, and trauma. Today's topic, Combined Clinical and Supervision Case Plans for Veterans in veteran tre Veterans Treatment Courts, can improve engagement, bring about behavior change, and increase success rates. 
Our presenters today will discuss why it is important to create case plans that combine clinical and supervision requirements for veterans court participants and how to do it. They will also share who should be involved in the process and how to use it once it is developed. Another critical element that will be discussed is the use of assessment in developing clinical treatment, supervision, and other case planning and how to use the findings from different tools to create individualized plans for each participant. SAMHSA is supportive of veterans treatment courts and provides funding for them through grants with training and technical assistance to the field through SAMHSA's Gain Center and through webinars like this and other resources. We are pleased to have incredibly experienced and knowledgeable presenters today, Dr. Brian Meyer, Dr. Shannon Carey, and we also are greatly appreciative of having members from the York Veterans Treatment Court team, Seth Forey, Victoria Jones, and Nicholas Molina, share their skill and hands-on experience about the process of developing integrated treatment plans, and we thank you all for sharing your time and expertise with us today. So I would like to thank the Gain Center staff for their work in developing this webinar um, and would like to turn it back to uh, Mr. France. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Now, before we get into the presentations, I would like to briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, you can see their information on the screen here. Um, but Dr. Shannon Carey is the co-president and director of development in, at NPC Research. Dr. Carey has worked in the areas of criminal justice and substance use disorder for over 20 years, particularly in the area of treatment court and court analyses. Dr. Brian Meyer is a clinical psychologist and the psychology program manager for the CBOC at the Central Virginia VA Healthcare System and assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatry at Virginia Commonwealth University. Mr. Seth Forey is the York County Veterans Wellness Court Coordinator. Uh, throughout his service to the County of York, he has served as a probation officer in various divisions, including the York County Veterans Court since 2018. And in 2020, he was promoted to the coordinator of the Veterans Wellness Court. He's been in that position ever since. Victoria Jones is a probation, a probation officer at York County Adult Probation in Pennsylvania, previously worked as a deputy sheriff in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and has been the Veterans Court probation officer since 2020. Mr. Nicholas Molina is a veteran justice outreach social worker at the Lebanon Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Pennsylvania, representing the VA on York Veterans Treatment Court team. He is a native Texan, served in the United States Army as a combat engineer, has multiple operational and combat deployments, including Kosovo and Iraq. So before I turn it over to um, uh, Dr. Carey and Dr. Meyer for their presentation. If we can show the results of the poll there, I see that we have about 80% of the, uh, the original, the first question. So if we can end the poll and show the results there. Okay. So sharing the results, um, it looks like we have a pretty even split, which is very encouraging. So about a third of you 29% from rural or extremely rural communities, uh, about 32% from suburban communities, and 40%, uh, 39, 40% urban, including I think I saw someone from the burgeoning metropolis of Spokane in the chat there. Um, so definitely nice to hear that we have a wide range of folks joining us. Uh, at this point, I would like to turn it over to Drs. Kerry and Meyer. As a reminder, please everyone, make sure that you drop questions in the Q&A pod, and I will be back after the presentation to share any of the questions you may have. All right, thank you, Mr. Friends. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start by making sure that we are all talking about the same thing when we say integrated case plan. So what we mean by integrated case plan in this case is that you're going to take your clinical assessment results, and you're going to have your own clinical case plan. And then supervision or a case manager is going to uh, assess people for their risk and their criminogenic needs, and they're going to have their case plan. And then you're going to work together to create an integrated case plan that's specifically for that participant. So you'll still have your own case plans, but this integrated case plan is for one, one that you will share with the team, that you will um, work together with a participant on, creating a simplified version that combines the key goals and information from both those separate clinical 
and um, supervision case plans. All right, so we are um, first going to talk about the concepts of risk and need, make sure that again that we're all on the same page around how we're defining those things. And then we're going to talk about the case planning process um, and the importance of promoting participant engagement. And then we're going to shift in particular to the York County to talk about getting it done and what does that look like. So what do we mean by risk and need? In this context, by risk, what we mean is the risk of, it's the likelihood that someone will continue the same behavior they have been. So most often risk assessments are measured in terms of validity by whether or not someone gets rearrested again. So if somebody's high risk, they're more likely to get rearrested. If they're lower risk, they're less likely to be rearrested. Um, because in the end, past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So when we're talking about risk in this instance, we're not talking about risk tools that measure necessarily the risk for dangerousness. Um, it's not going to tell you necessarily the risk for a specific type of crime or someone, you know, whether someone's likely to fail to appear in court or for other appointments. Um, it's not going to tell you what kind of sentence or disposition someone will get um, or what custody or security classification level they belong in. What risk assessment tools, validated, standardized risk assessment tools um, measure is the likelihood that someone will continue the behavior that they have been, in particular, the likelihood that they'll get rearrested. So there, many of you probably have heard of these before, but there's central, there's uh, eight central risk factors that are most predictive of someone being rearrested. So the first one is just the history of antisocial behavior that's most often measured by their criminal history. So this is an important factor. It is one of the most predictive ways. Again, past behavior predicts future behavior. So um, one of the best ways to measure the likelihood of someone being rearrested is if they've been re or arrest arrested frequently in the past. Um, the one thing about that risk factor is though that it's static. You can't go back and change the past. So it is what it is. But these, the rest of these seven factors are all what we call dynamic risk factors or criminogenic needs. And in the end, these are, and you'll see this as we get into the case planning piece, these are all needs that people have. Um, and those factors include antisocial attitudes, peer associations, so who they hang out with, their diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, which we're learning more and more that many symptoms of antisocial personality are actually symptoms of trauma. So you need to make sure you're assessing for trauma. Um, any issues with school or an employment, their substance use history, whether they have a substance use disorder, you know, who they're living with and where they're living and do they have a place to live and what their relationship status is. All of those factors are dynamic, which means you can interfere or, or provide services in those areas and you can change their risk level by providing them with services to help them deal with those areas where they are high risk or they have a large amount of needs. And then may I say something just real fast? Of course. Um, I just want to comment that um, when Shannon says that these are dynamic and you see that it says antisocial personality, you may have some kind of initial reaction to that. Traditionally, in the past, antisocial personality disorder um, was considered kind of an immovable thing. We know from much more recent research, and I certainly know from clinical practice as well, that antisocial personality is very movable, particularly if it is associated with trauma, as Shannon said. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. And and just to make it clear for everybody, Brian and I will jump in with each other. We, we like to present together and we like to share our thoughts as we go through. So um, don't be concerned if we accidentally interrupt each other, we're not offended. Um, so you don't need to be offended on our behalf. All right, so we've talked about what is risk, which is criminogenic, also known as criminogenic need, but what is need in this context? What we mean by when we're saying risk and need is clinical need specifically. So it's a little more narrowly defined as a diagnosed substance use disorder, a diagnosed mental health disorder, or both. 
So clinical need is specifically related to their substance use or mental health um, status. And part of what need assessments tell you is what level and type of drug and alcohol or mental health treatment is required for recovery. <laughs> oh, we're finding yeah. each other. Do you have more to say about this, Brian? No, go ahead. <laughs> we'll get into more detail soon. So um, the first thing we want you to do is get to know your participants, and that's what the assessments are for. So you need some specific tools to do that. So part of what you need to be able to do is select the appropriate screening and assessment tool for what you're attempting to measure. And you want to select those tools based on these factors. So Reliable, you want the tool to be reliable. That means it predicts risk consistently from person to person or predicts need consistently from person to person. A valid tool means that it's been tested multiple times in a specific population and it accurately predicts the outcome. Um, standardized means that it has a set of instructions for you to follow. And as long as you follow the instructions, you will get consistent answers. And then other things you want to take into account if you're selecting a risk tool, if you don't, if you have a choice, you don't always have a choice. Sometimes you're given the tool that you have to use, but if you do have a choice, you do want to look for ease of use, you know, like are the instructions easy to follow? If it's really complicated and it's difficult to get people trained on it, it can lead to people, you know, different people getting different answers using the same assessment. And then again, if you have a choice, Cost is typically a factor. Most of us don't have an unlimited budget. So you need to be able to consider, you know, that there are validated and standardized tools that are free. And there are also really great validated standardized, standardized tool that are um, super expensive. So you just need to know what your budget is and what your options are. So here's some examples of traditional risk assessments for a criminal justice population. So these, Particular tools are the most commonly used in the US. The risk and needs triage, the RANT is a screening tool. It is not a full assessment, but it's a great tool to use if you're attempting to determine from a really large population where people need to go. You can think of it, literally, it's a triage. You can think of it as the emergency room. You do a quick screen of people and you determine, does this person need to be admitted into the hospital or can I treat them here and send them on their way? The other two, the Ohio, the Ohio Risk Assessment System, the ORAS, um, also known depending on what state you're in, there are some states that use it. For example, Tennessee calls it the TRAS, um, is a very commonly used tool. And then the other most common tool is the LSCMI, the Level of Service Case Management Inventory. What these tools measure and what all validated tools measure. So if you have a tool that's not one of these, but it measures these top eight, the central eight risk factors, then you're probably, you know, in good shape. You want to make sure that your tool is measuring those top eight factors. So if you look at the LSCMI and the ORAS domains and the kinds of questions they ask, they do follow those top eight risk factors. So that's a really good thing. And when you're using one of those tools, you want to make sure not just to take the overall risk score at the end and say, oh, yep, this person's high risk and move on. You actually want to dig into each of those domains and use that information about where somebody has high risk. Not everybody that scores as high risk has all of these eight risk factors. They can score high in one area, but low in another. So as we get farther into this, we'll look into this more. But you want to make sure you're matching the specific treatment services and other services with the specific domain that the person has struggles in. So if somebody has a job and is doing, you know, is highly educated, you don't necessarily want to spend, in fact, you really don't want to spend time making sure that they get their GED or that they get employee ser employment services if, if they already know what they're doing. And this is what I'm saying in the slide. So pay attention to the score in each of the domains to build your case plan. Brian, can you talk about clinical needs assessments? Sure. So um, the risk and needs triage, the RANT, does uh, it have a quick, and it's a very quick version. It's a screen, as Shannon said. 
Um, the addiction severity index, um, which um, is, is a much more detailed instrument, and it goes into different substances and explains uh, where people are with different substances. So it's a, a much more thorough one. And the most thorough one really is the ASAM assessments, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, um, because not only does it have assessment, but it also has guidelines that fit that as the assessment pieces into placement. So it will say, you know, this person needs outpatient treatment once or twice a week, whereas this person needs an intensive outpatient program that is, you know, nine to 12, uh, hours a week or nine to 15 hours a week. And then this one will say, oh no, they need a residential placement or, or they need a detox facility or whatever. And so it's really helpful because the ASAM stuff uh, gives you direction about where you go based on their behavior and their dynamic factors there. So here are um, uh, the six dimensions of the ASAM uh, uh, criteria. Uh, the first one is a, acute intoxication and or withdrawal. And so those are parts that usually need much more uh, of a medical kind of response, at least initially, because you're dealing with a very acute phase in which a person can uh, either be or become quite ill. Uh, and in withdrawal from certain substances, they can have anything from uh, seizures to psychoses, psychotic responses. So you really have to be careful um, about the acute phase. Then you get into dimension two, which is biomedical conditions and complications that have to do with the person's health history. So for example, if somebody has a substance, a, an alcohol use disorder, um, and that person also has diabetes, that becomes very complicating because the alcohol contains, it's made of so much sugar, that the alcohol then use affects the diabetes and then makes the person or can make the person much sicker. So we have to pay attention to that kind of overlap. In dimension three, we're really talking about psychological factors. It's about their thoughts. It's about their emotions. It's about their mental health problems that they may have that are affecting the substances. So for example, the two most common factors, which we know as mental health diagnoses that are, are affect people with substance use problems are depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. They're way above and beyond all of the others. And so we see those over and over again, and we need to pick up on those because those people are polydiagnostic and we need to pay attention to those conditions. The fourth one is readiness to change. Um, it, it is really about motivation. And as we know, there are stages of change and we have to look at what kind of stage a person is in and their readiness to do that. Uh, it's kind of a encapsulized Eureka. If you know the Eureka, um, it also measures uh, readiness to change. In dimension, can I, yeah. Can I jump in there just for a sure. second, Brian, yeah. about that readiness to change? I think, one thing that people kind of simplify around readiness to change is this idea if they're not ready to change, then there's no point in working with them versus the, the idea that if you know where they are in their readiness change, how you respond to them differs. So if they're pre contemplation, then your idea, you know, you're, it doesn't mean, well, they're nowhere near ready, like out they go. It's, oh, well, I need to get them engaged. It's my job now to convince them that it's a good idea that maybe they do want to change or maybe cajole them or whatever, whatever the appropriate approach is with someone. Where they are in the readiness to change just means that you adjust how you interact with them, not that you give up on them. Exactly. So that if you have somebody who is, quote, not ready to change and says, I don't want to give up using my substances. I, I like what I'm doing right now. I don't want to change it. Um, then what we would do is we would, for example, look at their value system and what is important and what are their goals in life. And that's not what we would do when they are, for example, contemplating change. We're no longer looking at those things. We're actually looking at what would an action plan look like if you were going to be doing that. So de where, depending on where you are in these stages of change, 
which we haven't put up here um, for, for here. But the point is, uh, you would be doing giving a different response as a system, and if you're a treatment provider, you would be giving a different response as a clinician. Dimension five is um, relapse, continued use, or continued problem potential, which means that basically, uh, you know, maybe the person gets a short period of sobriety, maybe they get a longer period of sobriety, or maybe they don't at all. And so then we have to look at what is their relationship with relapse, what happens to them, because there are some people who relapse and they can get back on the horse where there are other people who, and when they relapse, uh, they're really going downhill. They're gonna have a downward spiral. And so uh, you have a very much harder time interrupting that. And so we really pay attention to what the person's individual style is when we're looking at this dimension. And then in the last dimension, we are looking at, you know, one of those pure needs, which is the recovery or living environment that they're in because obviously uh, that makes a difference. If they are living with other people who use substances or they are living with other people who enable their substance use, that really affects where we think about placing them. Um, and it makes it it's really important for us to understand these things. And sometimes, and in fact, often, I think it's important for us to engage the probation members of the team and have them go out and look at the living environment that the person has so we actually get a real report because it's one thing to hear what they say to us. It's another thing to see it. And that is one way that we can really pair up and integrate our work together. Um, so, <laughs> do you wanna talk about this, Brian? No, it's fine. So you might have noticed as Brian was going through the ASAM dimensions that there is a lot of overlap between that and some of those risk factors that I talked about, such as their living situation and having a substance use disorder. So um, I think they just did it to confuse all of us that the risk factors are also needs. So in the end, it's probably easier for you just to lump them all together and say these these are all needs. This participant, this individual has a lot of needs and we need to provide them with something that will help them meet that need. So one of the other aspects of risk and need is the idea of responsivity. So these responsivity factors are things that aren't necessarily directly connected to criminal behavior or their substance use disorder, but they are needs that someone has that might interfere with their ability to engage in the services that you're providing. So things like their relationships with other people, we talked about relationships being important, but there's a lot of different relationships that they can be involved in and the quality of those relationships are something that needs to be addressed as you're working through the system. So there are many courts that do not allow participants to have a romantic relationship with someone else, particularly if it's someone in the program also who, who has a substance use disorder or who is engaged in criminal activity. So one of the things that you wanna do is, is have them engage with positive peers and positive relationships with other people. However, as soon as you tell someone that they can't be with someone else, that person becomes the most attractive person they have ever seen in their lives. You know, it's the Romeo and Juliet syndrome. And so if you tell them they can't, and what you're really telling them is lie to me about that relationship because they're not going to stop seeing someone just because you said not to, What's more important is that you work with them, you know, on that relationship, have them tell you about the relationship, start to teach them what a positive relationship looks like and what kind of interactions are positive. If they, if you are, have them trust you and they tell you about them, you're much more able to intervene in that area and help make sure that those relationships eventually change because of your intervention and that allows them to better engage in the rest of the services that you're providing. 
So that's just one example. Things like nutrition, if they're not eating well and they have physical health issues, that gets in the way of their ability to engage in your services. If they don't know where their next meal is coming from, that makes it really difficult for someone to engage in that treatment group that they're sitting in if they're very hungry. So these daily, the daily living assessment is a tool that you can use. And this isn't, this is just an example, but being able to look at some of these barriers to engagement that people have is, can really help smooth the way for you to make, to help people be able to engage in your services. And in particular, those services that are going to directly impact the likelihood that they'll continue in um, the criminal justice system, which the goal is to get them out, right? So the daily living assessment gives you a nice little, you know, graph so you can see where the highest lines are and what, what you need to focus on. Before we jump into this, I, I think that there's one thing that's left out of these, which yes. I really think is really critical. And that is what facilitates the engagement in treatment. Um, and what I mean by that is we used to really care a lot about transportation. That was a really critical factor. And if a person couldn't get transported, we'd give them bus tokens or we'd find other ways to do it. Uh, nowadays, with uh, many courts being virtual, um, we have to provide them with other things. And fortunately, at least for veterans treatment courts, the VA, as probably most of you know, has a digital divide console. We can actually send a referral that will get somebody a tablet so that they can use it. And it can use phone signals rather than Wi-Fi because a lot of people who don't have the money to do a tablet don't have the money to do uh, a phone. Um, and so what happens is we can then connect them with treatment that way. And so that is a really, uh, that is one really important piece to assess is what is their access to virtual treatment. Absolutely, so important, Dr. Meyer. Uh, in fact, we've started creating in our office as part of our research and evaluation, helping courts um, with the daily, the, the changing world <laughs> that we're in basically. So a checklist of, of things to ask participants to determine what kind of help they need to literally physically be able to engage in services, whether it's actual transportation or whether it's virtual attendance at different services. We've talked about the risk assessment. We've talked about the clinical needs. We've talked about responsivity factors. And generally, if you're in probation, you or if you're a case manager, you'll create a case management plan based on your risk assessment. If you are a treatment provider or clinical case manager, you're building your clinical case plan based on that clinical needs assessment you performed. And now that you have those, we're going to start talking about how to create an integrated plan. If I can get it to move forward. Hello. There we go. Oh, somebody else is helping me. All right, now I'm lost. Okay, we got this down. So your assessment should lead to action. And that's where the um, case plan comes in. So when you're creating, you're taking your scores on each of these domains, for example, using the LSMI, if you're, you're the probation person or you're the um, probation supervision case manager, you're going to take, for example, we have, I have these scores that are for the LSCMI. So the max score in the LSM CMI in each of these domains is over here on the right, where you can see max score. Over on the left, I have an example of someone's scores. So you can see that this person doesn't necessarily have an extensive criminal history, but they are hanging out with people they shouldn't be in some way that are not good for them. They have some criminal attitudes and behavioral issues. They don't appear to have antisocial personality patterns. They don't have any issues with education or employment, or it's very low concerns there. They have good family and social support, um, yet they score high in terms of not necessarily having positive things to do. So their leisure, act leisure activities or pro-social activities are poor, and they have a substance use issue. As you go through with this example, the things that are green, you don't want to spend a lot of time on those. 
you don't want to be providing services for you know education or employment if they're doing fine in that area where you do want to focus in is those red areas so they're hanging out with their own people let's talk about who they hang out with and talk about getting them peer mentors and positive activities with pro-social peers um, if they have criminal attitudes and behavior you want to talk about maybe getting them engaged in some kind of criminal criminal thinking criteria or intervention this table I won't go through in, in detail, but what this does is help you think about addressing these risk factors or these criminogenic needs as a part of their behavioral health services in terms of flipping them on their head. So instead of looking at the risk factor as, as the thing that's you know creating the risk or the problem, you want to kind of flip it on their heads and think about what do we want them to do instead? So you can kind of create this table for yourself for each person and say, what is the need that this person has? So if they have an antisocial cognition or they have criminal thinking issues, then what they need to do, if you flip that around, is we need to help them develop more pro-social thinking. What are some ways we can do that? What are some interventions? So there's things like moral recognition therapy or thinking for change. As you're going through each assessment and you look at each of the domains where people are struggling, flip it around and think, what do they need? What do they need to do differently? What do we want to see instead? And what can we do to help them get there? Can That's I add something real quick? Before absolutely. You switch? Um, so Shannon has noted before, um, can we just make this go? Yeah, let me make it go back. And, and it's noted here, when you look at antisocial personality pattern, you need to check their trauma history. Uh, why is that important? Because the data says that 71% of people with an antisocial personality disorder actually have childhood trauma in their background, which is actually, when you think about it, is not a surprising thing. Where do you develop antisocial attitudes from? You're not born with them. No child is born with them. You learn them. So, okay, if you're learning them, you have to learn them then from negative experiences in your life. And usually those negative experiences are, are traumas. And there are very good assessments that one can use to look at it. The, the life events checklist is a very helpful checklist to look at historical trauma. And the adverse childhood experiences scale is very good for childhood trauma. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And please keep jumping in. So you've created the, your plan based on all of those domains and, and assessing where do they need help. And you start putting this plan together. And you do that on both sides, your supervision plan and your, you know, your risk assessment plan and your clinical needs plan. And now you're going to get together and include the participant in creating the integrated plan. You're going to combine the key focus areas and your goals from each of those plans and you're going to make sure that in the integrated case plan you're not doing something that's redundant or piling on too many things at once on the participant um, and the reason you want the participant to be engaged and we'll get into this a little bit further is that when a participant is involved with determining their own goals they are more likely to buy in and want to participate. So if they have a choice about what their goals are, and if they have the opportunity to say, I'm not sure how to reach that goal and to have some conversation about how to get there can really help ensure that the participant is able to succeed. And what you want is for them to have the experience of success. For a lot of people who are in the criminal justice system and end up in these treatment courts, they haven't necessarily had a lot of experience with being successful on their own, putting things together on their own. A lot of times, even those in the military have had a lot of structure around it. So, and you know, when we talk about these case plans, although this presentation is specifically for veterans treatment courts, we, we give the same advice across all the treatment courts that these integrated plans can really help with buy-in. And although, veterans have a different background and have some maybe have experienced a lot of success in the military there's always been a lot of structure and now we're putting them in an environment where they have to do a lot of their own work and sometimes they need some help there 
and making sure that they have buy-in and choice can make your job easier in the end. Completing case plans should be a process. It's a living plan. It's not something that here's your case plan. Okay, we're done. And now we're just going to follow the same one all the way through. It turns out, you know, how many people make plans and then reality hits. So there's plans and then there's reality. So you create the plan together the first time and you think, okay, this looks like it's doable and we're going to step up over time. So let's start with something that's, you know, that they can grasp that participants feel like, okay, this is something I can do in a reasonable amount of time. And then you can step it up if it turns out that it was right the first time, or if you're like, oh, I'm not succeeding. I'm not seem to be able to make meet this goal. Well, maybe that goal was a little too much and we need to back that off a little bit and make it smaller steps. So case planning should be dynamic and they should change over time. You should plan on changing those, changing the plans <laughs> over time. The only consistency in planning is that you're gonna keep have to keep planning. That change is constant. And veterans understand that because the saying uh, with combat is that no plan survives first contact. They understand. That's right. And you can see I have the same thing there twice. So first we have the matching participant abilities and stepping up over time because it's a dynamic plan. And it's key to match the participants abilities and then step over time. So the wording of the goals should address whatever's relevant in their dynamic risk factors at this time. Don't be addressing risk factors that aren't risk factors. So you can leave those out. It helps actually focus the plan a lot more and helps you conserve resources when you're not putting them toward folks that don't need them. So ensuring that you're matching the specific need of each participant and only giving those participants the services that they need. Have participants brainstorm with you, you know, about what, what, what other are their life goals? What do they care about? If their case plan, you know, meets the same things that they're interested in terms of what they want for their lives, they're going to be more engaged, just like any of us would be. You want your life plan to be something that's important to you that you care about. And you want to make sure you're talking with the participant about what they see as barriers or obstacles for them being able to meet that goal so that you can then help maybe those barriers become one of the goals that you work and moving that so that then they can get to the next goal. And it's also really important to talk to about them, talk with participants about what would incentivize them or what would make them more engaged or interested in participating in meeting their goals. Aside from just the pleasure of meeting the goal, it can be helpful to know if there's something that drives them, what motivates them. And is there something that you can provide to help them really become more engaged in this process? One of the benefits of an integrated case plan is that you are very clearly identifying for the participant and for the team. And this is what's important. You should be really sharing these integrated case plans. You don't necessarily have to, and with clinical case plans, you may not for confidentiality reasons, be providing the team with the entire plan with all the details of what's happening in that participant's life or their past trauma. The team doesn't necessarily need to know and, and shouldn't know all of those details, but they do need to know what the participants goals are, what they're working toward, because when the whole team knows what those goals are and what the participant is working on, then they can help encourage that process in all the spots that, you know, all the places in the program where they do have interaction with participants in some way. Um, or when you're deciding in staffing about how you're going to respond to participants behavior, if everyone on the team knows what their goals are and what they're working on in their plan, then they can help again, provide that kind of group think on what, what's going to be the best response for this participant based on what we know about them and what their goals are. Other benefits of the integrated case plan is it helps both the participant and the team to focus their individual treatment, their case management, supervision, recovery, coaching plans to support the overall goals. So if everybody's on the same page about where the participant is going, then each of those aspects can be supporting the plan in the end. 
and it provides a clear framework for the team in determining whether or not the participant is progressing. So if you have the same structure and requirements for every single person, you know, one issue is that people come to you in different places, right? So that having the, the same goals don't make sense. But when you make them personalized in this way for each participant, it can make it a little tricky to figure out is this, you know, has the participant met the requirements to move from one phase to the next? So if you have a really clear plan that everybody's on the same page, you can see when they're making progress and whether they're meeting the goals that you've decided are what they need to meet in order to progress to the next phase. It's also a great way to document that progress so you have something in writing. And I wanted to share a couple focus group quotes from people who were in treatment courts that had integrated case planning. And one of the participants had actually been in a different drug court, different treatment court in the past in another county. And in that county, they didn't have an integrated case plan. They didn't have a case plan at all. <laughs> they didn't really know what they were supposed to be doing. And so this participant said, you know, like, now we have a case plan. You, you set goals and in classes, you set the long term goals and then you break them down into little goals and how you reach them. It broadened my horizons. So the team doesn't just help you with treatment, they help you with your life is her feeling. And then another participant said, this program gives me something to work toward. I've never had goals in my life. Now I have goals. I've never been sober in my life. I thought this program was a joke at first, but now I say no joke. This program saved my life. And this participant is also someone who had OD'd multiple times while incarcerated. Um, and so when they're saying the program saved her life, she meant literally like <laughs> the, those goals and having some place to go, you know, led to her not being in jail and not, not using the way that she had been in a way that was going to kill her. So for steps, implementing the plan, get training and buy-in from the team. So this kind of training where you understand what's the purpose of an integrated plan, what does it look like? Um, identify how your team's going to communicate about the plan and how often. Um, talk about who's gonna take the lead in developing that integrated plan. So you've got, you, know, you might have your probation officer or your case manager or both, you know, creating that one plan and then you have your clinical person creating the treatment plan. Who's gonna lead the, the integrated plan? Who's in charge of that? Who's in charge with getting everybody together to talk about it, including the participant? And then your case plan document, having a nice outline or structure for this case plan should drive the work for the case management, treatment, probation meetings, recovery coaching. So having, you know, and we'll give you an example soon, um, having a really clear structure helps guide the meetings when you all get together to plan. And then have some formal review times where you step back and say, is this working? Um, every case management meeting should take a minute to say, okay, how are we doing? Is this right? Do we need to adjust the steps because it's not working? Or if it is working, is it time to level up? In particular, phase promotion is a really good time to do a formal look to see if it's time to make a new plan. All right, finally, we're going to show a sample case plan template, and then um, York County is going to talk about their specific template. So this first one is, is a little bit more generic one. It's not specifically for a veterans court, but it could be used in any, it, it really doesn't um, matter whether it's a veterans treatment court or a family treatment court or an adult treatment court. Um, the similar information should be being looked at. So you can see the first top part of this page is the list of those eight central risk factors. And it's just a simple, you know, you put an X any place where there's an issue in that area and that's where you focus your details. Um, you have a place for what drugs are being used and whether they're on MAT, whether they have a mental health diagnosis or any other diagnoses that you need to be aware of, such as physical diagnoses, issues with, you know, traumatic brain injuries, anything like that. Um, any impairments that they have, functional domains in terms of any barriers that they have for getting um, engaged in treatment. An example would be if someone has a cognitive disability of some kind, even dyslexia, if they have struggle reading, and maybe an audio version of treatment would be more appropriate. So 
areas that are needed to help them engage in the treatment process. All right, my slide advance is not working. Okay. There you go. Is someone else able to? I just did it. Shannon? Dr. Meyer, it seems Dr. Carey's been frozen. It does seem like that, so I'm going to jump in. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Dr. Carey will be back. Um, so uh, in this uh, sa sample case plan template, um, we're going to be looking at, remember, we have to look at both the risk areas that we're going to do out of the eight. We want to make sure we're looking at resiliency factors, things that support the person's success, uh, their ability to bounce back, their strengths, um, their social supports. And then we want to look at the responsivity factors, um, because these are all things, as we talked about before, that can either enhance or get in the way of their engagement in treatment. So instability or lack of social supports, lack of safe housing. It's hard to get engaged in treatment when you're living on the street. You know, there's all the mental health stuff, the medical stuff, the cognitive stuff, the transportation. I would also um, add to that, as I said before, that I think we need to look at the, their ability to have engagement in treatment through virtual means. We have to look at motivation. We need to look at their insurance, especially things like health insurance. That's a really important thing, especially when you're dealing with people, for example, who have you know, diabetes and alcohol use or, or people who are meth users and who ruin their health, uh, their physical health through uh, the use of meth. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we can uh, attend to those health factors and uh, other kinds of needs, including childcare, so that they can attend treatment. Um, so here is a sample one. Um, this is just a, you know, a sample of, an, of how you structure this. Here's the goals phase where you're reviewing in a certain number of days, the objectives that you're having from treatment, from case management, uh, and from probation and or a recovery coach. And this is what it really looks like in real practice. So for hey, example, Brian. are you back? I'm back. Okay. Uh, we, uh, I've been doing filling great. in for you. <laughs> you are doing great. Thank you so much for doing that. I don't know what, I don't know what happened there, but I'm glad to be back. I just wanted to point out one other thing in here is that these focus areas, it, it tells you again, what, you know, what area you're focusing on, what the goal is there and specific to that goal, any responsivity factors to address. So as someone is working on a specific goal, let's say they're um, trying to complete MRT. And as the, I don't know if the example came through, I'm not sure when I got um, popped off, but if someone has trouble reading, then MRT being a reading heavy intervention they do have an audio version. So the responsivity factors to address if their goal is to complete a step in MRT is remember this person has a struggle with reading, so they're using the audio version. Do you wanna go ahead with what you were doing, Brian? Um, sure, I can do this one. Uh, just to say, Great. here's an example. I mean, obviously pretty much everybody is coming in with a substance use problem. So this is gonna be a goal for just about everybody here. You know, and, and you're going to be looking at a goal where you're going to actually want to be able to measure it. So when you're looking at this one, it's nice that it says, for example, abstain from drugs and alcohol for 14 days. And that means 14 consecutive days. So that's really explicit to just say ex abstain. You know, uh, that's a hard thing for people. But if they know that there's where what the goal is for a period of time, then it makes it easier for them to respond to it. Um, and you can see here some responsivity factors. And so treatment says, well, we want them to attend treatment, which is IOP and individual therapy as scheduled. That's important. And then we're gonna look at that to see, oh, have they actually done that? And do we need to incentivize it more? Or is there, you know, if this continues to happen over a longer period of time, what kind of sanction might be appropriate? 
Um, and so then there's going to be a treatment plan with the therapist that the participant does that is really going to be working on coping skills for craving and for physical pain. Because let's say in this particular case that they're using alcohol and opioids, they've probably got significant physical pain. And then they're going to discuss their MAT options. Um, uh, case management objectives, there are certain things that they need to do. You know, they don't have insurance. We see that in a responsivity factor. So up here in case management, we want to complete an insurance plan. Uh, we see a responsivity factor about transportation, and it says do three transportation options with the case manager, uh, deal with the budget for the um, uh, bus pass, et cetera. And you can see how as you go across this, Anything that is listed on the, the left really has to be accounted for in treatment, in case management, and also in probation. There are pieces of it. So that they're, you're going to want to have a successful home visit. That's going to be an important thing to see. Because, you know, there's going to be a home visit, and they'll be looking around. And if the home is trashed, or if there are drugs lying around, that's a real problem. And they're not going to tell you that which is why the probation officer is so important in that, especially in that particular role. Um, or maybe they're working with a recovery coach. So they're looking at uh, how much recovery capital, the resources that they have uh, to uh, work on that are gonna help them uh, with their recovery coach. And so you get a sense of, of how these things integrate. You have the goal, you have these factors to address, and then each uh, different player in this and the, addresses their own areas with respect to the goal. And what's important about this particular form as well is when you're all working together on this, you can see what what each other, you know, what each team member is working on and when you might be overloading a participant. So if each, you know, if the treatment provider and the case manager and the probation officer all have things that the participant is doing required to do at once, then maybe treatment has, you know, a session for this participant at three o'clock and the case manager also wants the participant to come in at three o'clock on the same day. That's going to be an issue for the participant <laughs> to try and get to two places at once. We'd all love to be able to duplicate ourselves, um, but we haven't scheduled, you know, haven't figured out how to do that yet. So when you can see the requirements all together like this, it allows the team to help the participant, you know, figure out what to prioritize and where they need to go. And also you can see like, oh, we might be overloading this person because we're all doing an awful lot. And they also have a full-time job. So how are we going to handle this one? Oh, let's go back here. Sorry, I didn't think you were able to do it, but I guess you regained control. I regained control, yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And just in time to pass the baton over to Victoria from the York County Veterans Treatment Court. Um, and I will advance slides as needed, Victoria, just let me know. If you want to go to the next one, that'd be great. Okay, so this is the plan that we use in York County. Um, we complete this plan. It'll be the participant, the VJO, and the PO that all complete this plan together. And we do it in person during an appointment. And I'll turn it over to Nick. He's going to go over this first section here. Yes, yeah, so um, this portion of the treatment plan is the basic needs uh, portion. We just kind of outline uh, what their housing situation is, whether they're in a recovery house, uh, whether they're looking for um, financial assistance through maybe HUD bash or something like that for housing, figure out what their housing situation is. We go over their uh, finances um, with them to figure out what income they have coming in, um, along with employment. Some of these guys are service connected um, or on social security. So we kind of outline that to figure out what their financial um, need is if there is one um then we you know, talk about you know what interests they have like what do they like to do on um for recreation or their leisure time uh then we move over to the right portion of the section here where it talks about physical health uh to see if these guys and gals these veterans are being seen by the va when their last appointment was if there needs to be a scheduled appointment for their uh, primary care um 
And uh, then we go to like the mental health portion, figure out um, when they've last been seen, if they need to be seen, if that needs to be something that needs to be addressed um, during that time, um, along with um, the next portion is the substance use. Uh, figure out, what, you know, we should, by that time that they're in our office, we should know what their substance use is um, and see if they are being seen through the uh, community or through the VA. Um, and then the last portion there, parenting, family relationships, social uh, supports. This is where I like to see what are their natural supports? What's the relationship like with their family? Um, do they have children? Is their spouse involved? Um, so that kind of gives us uh, an idea of what their basic needs are. And then um, Victoria will go over the, Victoria, uh, the uh, veteran responsibilities here. So we have them read, if you want to go back one more slide. Okay, so up at the top where it says veteran responsibilities, we have them read that there. It basically says if they make any changes to this plan or if they make any changes to their treatment, they need to notify the VJO and the PO immediately. Um, so we have them read that and then the initial after each one, we go over that with them. And then we could jump down to these categories here um, where the check boxes are. So we pretty much start at BCAG and we list from one to 10 what they're doing, doing for each one of these categories. So for example, if we were to write BCAG, you would, we would write um, once a week. So they, for each one you write how often they're doing it and when they're doing it and where they're doing it. Yeah, I believe we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so just uh, on this one, for the short-term goals, this is what the veteran wants to accomplish while they're in the program. This could vary between um, phases, a certain amount of time. Once you bump up to the long-term, we we'll start looking forward to what they want to accomplish after they get out of the program. Um, the treatment completed section, this is just what treatment they might have already completed or what they completed as we update our specific plan. This would be things like maybe a batter's intervention program, um, inpatient, outpatient, anything uh, along those guidelines. Comments is what we open up to the veteran. Uh, what do they want to share with the team? What are specific things that they want to focus on? Maybe just how they feel about their progress in the program to this point. Um, that really about sums up those four categories on the back page of our case plan. So your overall case plan is, is basically kind of a two-pager, simple, yeah, so nothing, nothing to in depth. Exactly. So I'm going to, I have a few questions, actually, Brian and I have a few questions for you um, to talk a little bit more about your, the creation of the integrated case plan and how you do it on the ground. So you talked a little bit about who was involved with creating the plan. Can you Talk about how you communicate with each other and what that looks like in terms of, do you meet? Do you do it through email? How do you share the plan? What, is, what does that look like? So Nick and I, we communicate almost daily. Um, if I have any anything that's going on with the participant, whether it's negative or positive, I reach out to Nick almost immediately so that he knows what's going on. And if uh, treatment is involved, we can coordinate and connect them with treatment right away. Um, and and that, that also goes back and forth, like if there was a veteran who didn't um, go to an appointment or he, you know, skipped out on, on group, you know, I'm usually notified by the providers, so, you know, because every one of our veterans uh, that are in role to the VA, uh, they know, you know, they are known to be in veterans court, so they let me know whether this veteran is doing well, um, if he, he or she did something outstanding to share with the team or if he or she was not participating or being a disruption in the group. Unfortunately, that has happened. Uh, so that's where Victoria and I would get together um, and kind of figure out how we're gonna approach this by using, um, you know, asking Seth, using um, uh, other resources um, to help out there. So it goes both ways um, when we, we meet almost, now we meet every Friday there in our, our group, our veterans court time, so. And then we also do, Sorry, do schedule appointments together. Um, like one day a week, I'll make sure I 
put all of my participants on one day and they can come in for the appointment and he just kind of sits there and observes the appointment helps where he can or sometimes he doesn't have anything to contribute. I do think it is important for you know whoever you decide is going to be on the front line that they do have that you know communication with each other you can't just look at this every so often and um, it's not going to stay the same there's going to be updates so it is important that you um, do have those two having contact with each other so it can be updated or if one person notices something that the other doesn't you do have that chance to share it with each other plus it allows you uh, to not get split which is a really yes. common thing that people will try to do they'll, they'll split off one is the good and one is the bad and uh, and and try to give people different information and they're really testing you to see whether you can work together and so it's really important that you communicate so that the veteran treats it sort of like we try to hope that parents get to you know kids split people too you know they split their parents and and uh, parents have to really work together so that they don't get split off it's the same thing with veterans that's what they're what they're using it's one of their coping styles that, that I also think that it's important that we always a, approach the uh, veteran as a team um, the, as most often as we can so they know that you have, if you have one, you have the other. Um, so I think that creates a, a good dynamic and a good relationship within each other and, and good trusting with, with the veteran and, and his or her uh, providers. I do think Dr. Meyer hit it right on. They will try to pit you against the other. Uh, one person said this or one person said that, but if you Sure, that unified approach, it, it does, you know, come out a lot easier and it's a lot more successful to each participant that does this. I brought this slide up again just to remind people of your roles in case that's, you know, helpful for them to understand who, you know, who Victoria and Nick are when they're meeting with each other in terms of your role. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how the participant is engaged in that process? And then there's also a couple of questions from folks, but I'll, um, if you could talk about the participant first and then I'll make sure that you get those other questions. So, so right, I think, oh, go ahead, sorry, Victoria. Right from the beginning, um, we have the participant meet Nick and I. Normally Nick and I try to do like the orientation together and then also the intake together. So they're familiar with both of us. And then after they do the intake and they come in in phase one, it's probably about the second appointment that we schedule the treatment plan with them. So I let them know ahead of time, hey, Nick is gonna be in the appointment. We're gonna do the treatment plan. It's gonna take a little bit longer um, so they can schedule appropriately and we give them a time slot for that. And then same thing, like when they advance to phase two, we tell them, hey, we're gonna update that treatment plan again. It's gonna be me and Nick in, in an appointment. And, and the participants, do they pick their goals? Or do you pick the goal and they say how? So I would think it's a, it's a it's a mix of both. They have their own veteran specific goals, and we have goals that the court kind of has set for them as well, um, depending on what their case might be. But there's there's definitely a mix of both because if as us as the court just gives them all their goals, it's not going to be something that they're invested in. But if we let the participant kind of you know, maybe go about how they want to achieve those goals and have an own say in what they do, it, it sticks with them a lot more than us just saying, you have to do this, this, and this. But if we give them the opportunity to say how they might want to achieve something, you know, they have a better chance of accomplishing that goal. One, one person asked, in, I think in the chat, how do you avoid overwhelming the participant with it, that it seemed like the plan looked a little overwhelming? What do you, how, do, what's your response to that? I guess I'll leave it open. Well, I think it's important that when we first meet with the veteran to let them know it is going it, to, it's not a walk in a park. This is a invested program. This is uh, you need to understand that it is, uh, it will be overwhelming, but the, to be, to comfort them or to reassure them that there are resources available to them, that we are here for them when it does become overwhelming and to reach out to those, uh, to those parties like either myself or Victoria or Seth to let them know that, hey, we are here. Uh, we're a part of your journey. You're not alone. And I think that even though that, you know, it looks like a lot, I don't think Nick and Victoria overwhelm them by just overloading this case plan. I think in the, you know, beginning phases, beginning part, they might start smaller 
not fill out every single box on the case plans where it just looks like it's a daunting, overwhelming task. Yeah, and some of these things are broken up into different phases. I know like in our court, they don't have to do like their DUI highway safety until phase two. So if they were to have to do like batterers intervention and DUI highway safety, batterers intervention would be phase one, DUI highway safety phase two. So it's not like we're throwing everything at them all at once. Great. I have one other question and then I think we're gonna segue into the more formal question and answer though that we've been sort of answering a little bit all along. Uh, how do you handle situations when a participant doesn't meet a goal in the case plan? So when they don't, it depends on the goal. Um, so if it's a goal when we're talking about in terms of the front of the case plan where it's like a requirement and they don't meet it, there are sanctions involved for that. But obviously we'll take into consideration, you know, why they didn't meet the goal and bring it back to the team and say, this is what we're looking at. Um, it could be a sanction if it's something that they just completely pushed off and they're not willing to do it. But if it's, for example, a housing goal and they're trying to work on getting out of a recovery house, then we're going to go back and look at the goal and say, all right, what's a manageable time frame for them to complete this goal rather than sanctioning them for it. I would agree with that. You don't want them to feel defeated. I think, um, as you said in your presentation, you know, maybe make it a little bit simpler, um, set different time frames in order to help them, you know, re-engage that goal. Just don't give up on it. Just revisit it and see, you know, what else can we do to maybe better assist them in achieving it? I think going along those lines with one of their goals, such as housing, is something that we could do. It's a great example. And when they do reach a goal, do you have incentives built in? Yeah, there's, we do have a couple of things, you know, such as we have the typical ones, such as gift cards and, um, you know, something as simple as judicial praise for achieving their goal goes a long way. Um, it does. It's huge. But we are able to do stuff, you know, as long as we know what was related to that goal, maybe we can get something out of the box that we just have to present um, as a team. Um, but I, I, something as simple as judicial praise is, is a lot because a lot of the time they're in front of a judge, it's not always positive, you know, a lot of time they're, they're there for a reason, but it, that's one of the bigger things that I do see have an effect on a lot of the veterans. Yeah, I think Seth, that's a really important point that I think judges don't always realize their, their power for good as yes. well as the, the <clears throat> power for sanctions and how much difference it makes from that source for a participant or a veteran to hear, I'm proud of you you did a really good job on that thing. Or I saw you do that, that was great. You know, that's huge for participants. Yeah, I think that's especially true of newer judges um, because you know when you come from a criminal court, for example, you know, you're used to giving sanctions. You're not used to giving incentives. You're not used to giving praise. And so, uh, I mean, one of the things we have to do at the beginning is we have to, um, uh, when we have new members of the team come on, we, and it's not just judges, but everybody, we have to uh, get them uh, you know, educated as to the style of how we do this. And that we know that, uh, that incentives are much more powerful than sanctions as motivators to change behavior because sanctions yeah. say no, incentives say, yes, do this. You're doing the right thing. And that's what's so important. It puts them in the right directions. Sanctions don't tell them what the right directions are. It only tells them what a wrong direction is. And it is, it is a key part, you know, not to keep striving on that. I mean, we luckily have a judge who's on board with those incentives and um, sanctions, but sometimes I do feel you get a judge who might have the lines blurred between a typical court session and what a treatment court session is. So I think just giving that friendly reminder that, hey, you know, just say something, a couple words of, you know, pride or something along those lines and it goes a long way so i think there are some questions in the formal q a and brian you had indicated that you wanted to answer a couple of them live actually the first one i pressed the wrong button um the you second the checklist a? so i'm i'm in the q a now uh it says i mentioned the ace the second checklist uh, about trauma is called the life events checklist the lec and it's usually called the LEC-5, and it's free, uh, as is the ACE. You can get both of them for free. 
Um, and what, what about the question on MAT? You know, that's a very tricky question. The question on the MAT says, should MAT be a mandate if it's recommended on their substance use disorder assessment, but the client is not interested? Uh, some of this depends, honestly, on what your state law says about mandated treatment and how specific that state law is about mandated treatment. And it's one thing to mandate treatment. It's another thing to mandate a very specific kind of treatment. I know, for example, in Illinois, somehow the state law says that if MAT is done, then only naltrexone must be used. Um, and that You can't use buprenorphine, in other words, or suboxone. Um, and we could get into the craziness of that. And yes, it's politics and lobbying, but I'm saying that state laws do in fact get that specific. So it really matters what your state law says. The second thing I think is it's really important to understand why the client is not interested. Let me give you an example. You know, um, in a lot of NA groups, not all of them, but in a lot of NA groups, they take a no medication attitude. You're not allowed to use medication, uh, a, a, a substance of any sort at all. And the national NA folks have taken the stance that local NA people can make their own decisions about that. In fact, they have a pamphlet about it, um, and it which explicitly says that. So you have to be careful about these things because if NA, for example, is gonna be something that's helpful for somebody, but the local NA is saying, well, we don't want you to use anything. Then we really have to do uh, what is essentially a pros and cons. And especially I would do something like a decisional balance and a decisional balance is the pros and cons of each side of this. In other words, if you use the MAT, what would be good? If you use the MAT, what would be not good? If you didn't use the MAT, what would be good? And if you didn't use the MAT, what would not be good? And then what you do is you look at the diagonals on this because the, diag the reasons why the pro for one thing and con for the other tend to add up together. And that really helps shake a lot of people loose on this kind of stuff. So I think this may be a clinical issue that needs to be addressed in psychotherapy and through motivational interviewing when you're trying to deal with something like this. Right, and I noticed in the chat, a couple of people have mentioned that they would like an example of a completed um, case plan, so, or integrated case plan. So it, you can see up on the slides, there's emails. So if you wanna email Seth, Victoria, or, or Nick, would you guys be able to, you know, like obviously de-identify a, a plan and share it with someone if they wrote and asked you for it? I don't think sure. that should be an issue. We should be able to uh, share yeah, it. I don't mind. And I have one that's not specifically for a veterans court, but it's more of the example that was on the screen, but completely filled out. And so if you're interested in that as well, you can email me and I can send it to you. This has been great. Uh, absolutely appreciate all of the insights. Uh, we have time for one question and we have about 10. I'm, I'm very glad that Dr. Kerr, you've been able to integrate some of them in. Uh, but there's a couple, I think, that, that may be interesting from both uh, Dr. Meyer and Dr. Kerry's standpoint, but also the York County team is integrating the treatment uh, plan with this, this integrated plan. Um, some uh, one questioner said that the treatment uh, gives them a generic plan and they don't know how to integrate that. Or if you get an infrequent update plan with the VA, I understand Nicholas being very involved is, um, is a, a key. So integrating treatment plans with this, uh, this plan, how is that done? I, I'd be interested to hear from both standpoints. So if a veteran is, has been um, identified as needing a needing one-on-one and group, that is part of the integrated treatment plan that I follow through and make sure that he or she is being seen accordingly and, and as needed or as recommended by the provider. Does that, does that answer? I, I think that does answer. I mean, in, in just uh, as some indicated, just the VJO's presence at the table is critical to provide that link. Uh, Dr. Yes. Meyer, Dr. Carey, I'd like to hear your perspective on integrating actual treatment 
perhaps notes or plans with this integrated plan. And, and that is what the intention is. The integrated means it integrates the treatment plan with the supervision and case plan. So I think in veterans courts, sometimes it can be a little trickier because the, the actual provider might not be, or frequently isn't the one at the table in the team. And so it's the VJO who's translating for the treatment providers that they might be going to. Um, so the VJO plays the perspective of the treatment and as much as possible will integrate, you know, what the clinical treatment plan goals are with the overall plan. So it's all, it's still integrated. Um, and in a, in a situation, some veterans treatment courts, they might, you know, some people might be going to the VA, but others are allowed to go into the community if the VA doesn't have the services they need or something. And then you, you really need the, you know, somebody who should be representing treatment to be a part of that integrated planning team, the one who plans the case plans. Dr. Meyer, is there something else you would? Yeah, I would just add, because Dwayne, you mentioned uh, 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 notes, and I would say that actually treatment notes don't belong in a case plan. Um, I mean, those are confidential. Um, a, a VJO can see them so that the VJO can, uh, VJO can summarize them because they're available in, in the case record, but the actual notes themselves really are really supposed to be more about what's between the, it's a medical record, it's between the patient and the th psychotherapist or the psychiatrist and, uh, and some things that get discussed that may need to be in a um, in a note, for example, child sexual abuse, you have to actually say that in your note, but um, uh, do the details of that belong in, in a court setting? I don't think so, because that can traumatize not only the participant, but some of the people on the treatment team as well. No, I, I think that's uh, absolutely uh, important to, to understand is, is to be able to have somebody at the team that can, can communicate some of those things, but also that you don't have to communicate everything. Um, this has been absolutely great. Um, I absolutely appreciate all the attendees. There's been a lot of really great questions come through. We were able to answer some uh, through, uh, through the, the uh, typing them. Um, I have captured all of the, um, the questions. We're going to share these with um, the attendees. Um, you are going to be able to um, get uh, a certificate of attendance, right? So we're going to drop that uh, in the chat. You can see um, that you have a pop-up. Uh, in the pop-up, uh, if you're interested in downloading this, um, you can get that. Um, several of you have asked for the... Um, uh, an example of the slides. Uh, so the slides and the recording will be distributed after uh, to all of the register participants, whether you were able to attend the entire event or not. Um, we would like to uh, launch one final poll as we close our time here. Um, if you haven't signed up for the GAINS listserv, then I encourage you to sign up. Um, here is uh, the link on the page, and uh, Ashley is going to um, uh, Ashley is going to uh, drop the link in the um, uh, in the chat, uh, and then we would like to thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar um, was uh, supported by or or uh, brought to you by the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, and the GAIN Center appreciates your ability to be able to attend. Um, I think uh, as I'm trying to um, speed through these, I think there's one last question um, that, that came in late. Um, I thought it was a great question, and I wanted to speed through the end to allow Dr. Carey to address that question. Uh, and this is, um, this is about the VGO not being involved. So, uh, Dr. Carey? Uh, thanks. I don't know if I can answer it. It's a, I just wanted to share, like someone asked, said that they are in an area where the VGAO is not involved and she loved how Nick is involved in this one. Actually, I don't know if it was she, he or she, <laughs> um, liked it that Nick was involved. And I, it's a common issue that I run into in VTCs and veterans treatment courts is that the VGAO is not very involved with the program itself. And they sometimes struggle with getting information 
from treatment at the VA. Does anyone have, you know, Dr. Meyer or Nick or anyone have any suggestions for what you can do if you're in a veterans court where the VJO is, you know, covering too big of an area and can't be that involved or? And I have, uh, Dr. Meyer wants to go first. I think I have a little bit of insight. Go ahead. Um, I think at certain points, you know, we've run into that issue where, you know, you might not have somebody who can be there all the time. And I think it's a, it's a little bit more of a process for the probation officer, whoever the, you know, case manager might be, but at times they kind of have to have wear multiple hats um, where they served as the one who kind of filled on the treatment side or here in um, York County, we do have um, York Adams Drug and Alcohol Commission who serves as a case manager on other teams. You might not necessarily have um, the VA side of things, but if you can have somebody else that, you know, you do have available, maybe that would be um, something that's available to you. I think that it can be helpful to sit down with the VAJO and find out what is realistic uh, in terms of what their, uh, what their responsibilities are um, and so that you can get some understanding and maybe some conversation going about that and what would be helpful and to figure out if there are uh, some other ways that you can do things. I mean, even if a person has a large uh, area to cover, maybe they could um, you know, meet virtually or something like that so that you can sit down and problem solve those issues so that maybe you can have more communication with each other. And is there any avenue when, when courts are struggling with getting information from treatment providers that are within the VA, is there any avenue for asking or, or getting access to more of that information? Or is it just really from location to location? I feel like that's probably a location to location um, ordeal. Um, I've been, uh, I'm, I get, I, <laughs> I love what I do, so I'm, I'm fully, fully invested in what I do. Um, and unfortunately, I feel like sometimes that's not always the case or the caseworker him may be overloaded themselves and, and can't provide that, that as much attention as, as one another person. So it's really like it's case by case basis. Okay, to wrap that up in my own uh, personal experience in Colorado, we have uh, six veteran courts uh, and there was a point in which the, the VJO couldn't be in six places at once, like two or the courts always had the same docket. Um, and, and so through the Eastern Colorado healthcare system, they actually increased VJOs, they brought in more staff. So they have some that are specifically working with incarcerated veterans, some that are managing courts in the North and some that are managing courts in the South. So I think Dr. Meyer's communication of making sure that just having that conversation with the VGO team, and it's usually out of the healthcare system level. Of course, the VGOs are located at the C box, uh, and, but really being able to communicate to someone at the healthcare system and just say, um, uh, <laughs> the VGO's uh, job is challenging, but it can be much less challenging if they work in conjunction with the, uh, with the veterans courts. Um, so can this is- One thing uh, real quick just is to say is it can also be helpful to give them data. Because when um, VJOs, uh, I mean, if, if they're spread too thin, you know, it's helpful to have data to make an argument for uh, further staffing. And we have been up staffing VJOs slowly, but it's been happening consistently. And so if you can provide data to your VJO to pass along about mm -hmm. it, and they can collect that from their other courts, that'll be helpful to them to go to their supervisor and say, hey, can we consider asking for another position here? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that uh, veteran courts are a great example of federal, state, local, private, nonprofit collaboration. You, you don't see this kind of collaboration outside of veterans courts quite a bit. Um, and uh, absolutely the veteran justice outreach officers, as well as the probation officers, the clinicians, Public defenders, uh, the judges, the peer mentors, everyone is a critical member of the team. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining. Um, we absolutely hope that everyone is able to get some really great information. Once again, we've been downloading or uh, uploading the certificate of attendance in the chat. That will also be sent out uh, afterwards 
um, and uh, we will make sure that all the slides are there as well. So thank you very much to our panelists and thank you to everyone attending. And we hope that you all have a very great day.